So this is our first of two trainings this year on baseline technologies. We've got an advanced one coming up later in the year. I'll be dropping a link to that into the chat and talking about that a little bit more at the end of the day. Um, we've got four people here are, who are helping us out. Three are here right away, and William's going to be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, myself, I am Brian Rowe. I'm the project coordinator for um, the Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, which is housed out of Northwest Justice Project. Um, I work a lot on several different TIGs here at Northwest Justice Project, and I try to answer uh, questions for the community, provide a help desk, provide an email list that I strongly recommend people um, check out. I'm going to be putting a link to our email ad uh, list in the um, chat area. Um, it is a Google group. Um, if you have an email address that is linked to Google, um, you can just apply to join. If you have an email address that is not linked um, to Google, you can email me. I'll put my email address in there, and I can manually add you. One of the best resources for help around the baselines is the email list. We've got over 600 legal services, technologists from around the country. If there's something that you're looking at implementing technology-wise, whether it's a baseline technology or a cutting-edge innovative technology, there's probably a few other organizations that have done similar things there. Um, we have with us today um, Jeff Hogue, who is the Community and Relations Relations and Operations Manager over at Legal Server, um, formerly of um, legal services organizations in the New York area, who has worked on several different TIGs. And then we have Jane Ribadonera, um, Program Analyst for Technology for Legal Services for the Legal Services Corporation. And then William Guyton, the Director of Information and Technology for Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma, will be joining us shortly. Um, the way that these uh, slides are set up, they are in the order of the baselines. So if you download that PDF document and follow along, um, you'll have a significant amount of extra um, text and recommendations that are in the baselines beyond what is just um, in the slides that we're talking about here today. So I strongly recommend downloading that. Um, we're going to start with technology planning, and the way that this is going to work is that um, one of the three or four of us are just going to introduce and talk about the topic a little bit, and then the other members of the panel are going to um, add any suggestions or uh, best practices that they have, and we will take uh, questions as we go along. Um, on the first one here, we've got several different points on technology planning. Um, technology planning plans should be reviewed and updated as needed every year. Um, I just want to ask one, uh, kick this over to Jeff for a second. What types of things do you think should really be in that technology plan? And what things would you want to change um, on a yearly basis? Or what are things that are a little more uh, concrete in looking at a technology plan? Thanks, Brian. Well, you know, one thing that I've noticed is that um, ever since uh, LSC said, hey, here's what, a, you know, you guys should have technology plans, you know, people kind of treat it as something that's uh, uh, something to get off their checklist. And so I think what a lot of folks did was look at that um, requirement and or that recommendation and then um, fill some things in. I think the, my two cents is to keep it short. So the first one I made was 20 something pages <laughs> and I'm sure absolutely no one read it uh, after I finished it. So um, first I'd say just as a matter of format, keep it short. And then I would recommend if you're really gonna do it once a year, um, try to pick right at the very beginning, pick a goal or two of what you're going to try to accomplish. Because the truth is, is, when you sit down and look at all of your technology, you're probably going to come up with a pretty long list of things to do. Oh, make sure we're ready for, you know, IPv6. And uh, I haven't really looked at the firewall settings in a while. Oh, I should back those up. You know, all those things um, might become an unwieldy to-do list. So I think having a a, a goal right at the beginning on the front page that you know everyone you distribute it to is actually going to read. Like, 
Uh, our goal is to do a better job of training this year. <laughs> um, uh, might be be good. Um, I think that we have we had once solicited some uh, technology plans. It's probably time to do that again because I'm curious if uh, the sophistication people are putting into it has changed. But um, uh, yeah, that's what I. I that's what I'd say. And then I think, you know, the first thing that you do when you do the review of technology plan is, did we meet our goal? Um, and, uh, and, and it's really about priority setting in my mind. So staffing and, uh, and dollars have to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and one, one of the things I really want to point out is that the, um, the sub points under, under this also uh, definitely include that you should be evaluating things like um, are cloud services useful? What are the risks? What are the benefits um, there? What is the backup situation for your servers? Um, disaster preparedness. We did a series of webinars and a best practices guide on that about two and a half years back that's available on LSNTAP. Um, but it, it should look at some of those common scenarios and have some ideas there. Um, Jane, is there anything that you would like to add or some uh, things that you've seen from good technology plans that you think people should include? Sure. I, I, Jeff, I think you made a great point about the don't get too involved or too long of a plan. Um, you know, and, and, and also sometimes, you know, we go on site visits and and look at technology plans, different programs submit. Um, and oftentimes I think of it as, as, as it's not really a plan. It's kind of like, here we are. But what, you know, what we often don't see is where are the goals? Where do you want to go? Um, you know, and you have to kind of break it down between what are sort of ongoing maintenance things that, that the IT people, uh, whether it's internal staff or whether you have, um, you know, outside consultants working on, you know, those are those are ongoing things. But what are sort of the, the strategic goals to move the organization forward in its use of technology? And in order to do that effectively, um, that's something beyond just the IT people's uh, involvement is, is really important. Um, we often recommend that programs look at kind of having a technology planning committee um, and to include people from various uh, types of positions, uh, from support people, intake staff, um, to paralegals and attorneys and managers, uh, so that you have a cross-departmental and cross-positional uh, kind of representation on that committee to really think about you know, wh what, what they need to help them do their jobs well, not just what the infrastructure is. Um, and, and to make sure that, that leadership understands that you know, technology should be a part of any sort of strategic planning process. That might not be done yearly, you know, but that might be more of the long-term goals. Um, but then each year kind of think about what can we tackle this year and set some goals, set, set some timelines of when you want to um, accomplish these things so that you can go back and review it. Um, you know, periodically with that committee. And it doesn't have to be a month, you know, this could be something that meets twice a year, um, you know, kind of in a planning stage and then maybe six months later in a review stage, just to kind of do a check-in and see see how you're doing, see if uh, your priorities need to change uh, at all or not. Um, I did post some some good resources we have uh, that's on a later slide when we get to the end. There's some resources up there. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure and point out is there was a session a couple of years ago at the TIG conference that Steve High um, did on, it's called the Tech Planning Smackdown. And he talks a lot about sort of tactical planning versus strategic versus, you know, what kind of things are you going to do to drive uh, and in furtherance of your the mission of your organization. Um, and I'd really recommend uh, people interested in kind of uh, thinking about how to go about that planning process, uh, take a look at that um, video that we have. Excellent. Now, I, I really like that breakdown of tactical and strategic. It gives you the idea of those overarching goals, where you're trying to go, but then also a breakdown of things like, what does our computer replacement policy look like? Do 
do we have a continual system for upgrading things? Is there a way that we check occasionally to make sure that our servers are secure, that type of stuff on kind of the tactical side? Mm -hmm. So we've got on here that um, it, it covers more than just hardware and software. Um, that we have client data related issues, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, and I think Jane did a great job of talking about how um, they're working on several different areas across the organization. This is not just something that the tech staff should sit down and come up with themselves. Having end users involved in the process helps significantly. Uh, the next one that we have on here um, covers uh, kind of budgeting and staffing personnel issues. Um, organizations should at least have two full-time technology staff or consultants per uh, 100 FTE staff members. And I know that this is uh, one of the more kind of con concrete recommendations that was added when the baselines were updated um, in 2015. Um, what types of things do these staffs uh, do particularly and um, what are some examples of putting those staff internal versus kind of um, external consultants that you guys have seen? Um, Jane, are you willing to take a first crack at this one? Sure. Um, so, yes, oftentimes the, the internal staff can uh, be somebody that, that uh, um, you know, really understands how the um, legal services program makes the best use of technology and can can help them be a little bit more strategic about that use um, you know and then also be be there for kind of day-to-day -day troubleshooting um, it's you know it i have actually been um, impressed by programs ability to to get uh, some real sort of generalists who can cover a lot of different areas but oftentimes you know especially as as technology um, advances more and more, it's really difficult to find one person who knows everything, whether it's from networking to software, um, you know, to, to knowledge management, document assembly, those types of things. Uh, so you, you have to sort of prioritize what's the most important internal expertise you need. And then, um, you know, have a combination of uh, maybe, you know, some of the network infrastructures, making sure all of your uh, systems are updated, uh, you know, whether you want to move to the cloud or not, um, you know, even some of the help desk fun functionality that can maybe best be done through a consultant who has uh, maybe multiple staff people on board and you're just, uh, you know, paying them one fee, but you're getting the expertise of a lot of different people, depending on uh, what you need um, at any one time. Yeah, to give you a little bit of an example of what the staff breakdown kind of looks like um, here at Northwest Justice Project, we're about a 230, 240 person um, organization, gets a lot larger when we take on um, interns. Um, we've got one individual who's newer on the tech staff that is kind of learning everything and uh, primarily doing that through help desk, kind of a junior member. Um, we've got one individual who has significant server experience um, he does mentor with the harder help desk questions, um, but he basically does disaster recovery, implementation of new systems, that type of stuff from a network admin. So about 80 or 90 percent of his time is there. Um, and then the third individual we have um, does support between the two is kind of a, a mid-level member um, of the team who is also a, at that network admin um, level. And then we have uh, one individual who works specifically with our law help um, website, and we occasionally bring on um, consultants to deal with more challenging web related things. We do not have a Drupal developer, uh, although our website is in Drupal and we contract externally um, with um, pro bono net for law help interactive stuff. So there is some consulting that goes on there also. That's kind of the the four to five um, FTEs and where they are kind of in Northwest Justice Project. Um, for one other example of an org that I uh, worked with recently, um, this was a, about a 30 person org from the uh, protection and advocacy area 
um, Disability Rights Washington, they actually go with that external um, help desk model where they um, have a service um, that maintains their computers, does updating, they can ask any questions related to servers, printers, those types of things. So that is all external. And then they have one uh, individual who is um, a part-time kind of admin staff person who also uh, helps a bit on the internal on-site things and kind of keeps track of their strategic planning um, does some of the light duties that you would see kind of at a, a chief information officer um, on the planning side and strategic side and works with external contractors for their website or for their uh, video production needs or other things like that. Um, Jeff, is there any um, examples from organizations that you can share or any suggestions here on when you kind of look at internal versus external staff? Sure, and, and I should say, you know, when we looked at, as a group, at what, I think partly we wanted to just communicate to programs that maybe still were having technology done as a one-tenth FTE of somebody who kind of knew computers, <laughs> that the industry in general um, uh, was, is, was staffing technology at a much higher rate than what we saw in legal aid. Um, and I'd say even since we worked on the baselines, you know, it, back then it was still sort of new to some programs that if email or network stopped working, workers wandered out in the hallway and said, what do I do now? And now I think this is just presumed that these are mission critical systems. So uh, a lot of times I see somebody who's been an advocate um, who ends up in the sort of strategic position of what should our priorities be? hey, you know, we really could save some time if we automated some pleadings or um, <laughs> we, we finally got rid of WordPerfect and only supported one, uh, you know, word processing program. And then a lot of times if it's just two, the other person is helping with uh, more of the retail uh, support. So my printer doesn't work. Um, somebody's got to run that back up on Saturday, that sort of thing. So that's that's a a common breakdown. I will say that the closer the strategic person is to the executive director's office, the more likely it is that the efficiencies that can be gained from technology are going to be uh, noticed and listened to. And one, it is very common for orgs as they grow in size <clears throat> to initially give those responsibilities to a lawyer who happens to know Word really well, and then that person develops over time um, the skill set and ends up moving a lot of their uh, position into the strategic planning uh, technology side. If that happens to be the case, um, I would strongly recommend um, getting that person to some conferences, kind of the way that we send our, all of our lawyers to CLE training, um, get them out to the NTC conference, which just happened out in DC, which is a um, national technology um, conference that has a, a lot of sessions on planning um, all of the different areas that are in these baselines. You can find a session on them from data security to backups to staffing uh, to how to do outreach. Um, make sure that you're giving the people that you're putting into those positions the ability to uh, gain these skills and that they're not just looking at contracts and kind of dealing with the tactical. Your The benefit from that is going to be much higher. Um, the other the other thing uh, I want to point out with with N10, uh, the nonprofit technology network, they're the ones that run the NTC, is uh, one of the resources with the baselines that we used for guidance on the, the both the personnel and I think looking at budgeting too. It's it's a good resource. Um, is there they do an annual technology staffing and investments report. Uh, so you can just uh, Google N10's nonprofit tech uh, staffing and investments report, and and that's it, it's for it's for all different sizes of nonprofits. So you can sort of determine are are we considered you know is your organization considered small, medium, large, and kind of see how you compare to what other uh, nonprofits in in the sector um, uh, do in terms of budgets and and staffing. No, that is excellent. They they have a wonderful website with lots of good resources. Um, I just put the URL for N10 into the uh, chat, and then the 2016 
staffing report. I'm going to drop into the chat here in just a second. Um, let's move on uh, to the next topic here, which is uh, budgeting. Um, and we've got a few different points here, the need for ongoing maintenance and upgrades as part of this budgeting, um, the personnel and consultants, and then training in the use of technology. Um, when I end up dealing with organizations, um, the training issue tends to be one of those that is often uh, missed in budgeting. And there are some things that you can definitely plan in and try to also leverage the community as part of that. Um, as you probably know, LSMTAP has an entire list of trainings throughout the year. Um, there are some of the trainings that we do, um, such as some of the security type things that taking pieces of that and then working with a professional to turn that into a training in your organization is, is really useful. Um, Jane, what are some of the things that you see that people uh, commonly miss in budgeting that catch them um, unaware or unexpected later? Um, well, I think that I think the training is is definitely something people always under budget or neglect to budget for. Uh, you know, we especially in TIG projects, we see people trying to implement new technology, uh, and there's kind of two parts of that is. Yeah. First, you have to make sure your staff is capable and has the tech, basic tech skills they need before you start implementing something even higher level. Um, you know, if they're currently not making great use of the functions that you have in either your word processing or your case management um, program, and you're trying to introduce a, a higher level document management system, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of missing a step there. Um, so you need to really be able to assess their skills and then also budget and adequately provide training in what you what your current systems are. Um, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, before you start doing anything uh, even more expansive, um, you know, make sure people are, are functioning and uh, performing at the highest level that they can. Mm -hmm. um, one, one other thing to definitely think about there when putting together this budget um, is look at how um, it can benefit um, the organization. I've worked with several organizations um, that have had kind of a replacement policy where they, they wait for things to die and then they order a new computer or maybe they have a, have a computer or two sitting around that they then uh, transfer in and out. Um, having a more proactive strategy that upgrades on a regular basis um, can actually save you a significant amount of staff time during those transitions um, and keep things moving. Although it may seem like you're spending a little bit more um, in the process of doing those continual upgrades, uh, the lack of downtime for staff needs to really be considered as part of the return on investment for putting together those maintenance and upgrade. Uh, things. Um, Jeff, is there any recommendations that you have here uh, with regards to budgeting? Just the only thing I'd say is that, you know, in in, in lean times, um, the truth is that uh, budgeting for technology and preserving that and probably fighting for that, that piece of the pie if you're um, the technology responsible person is um, you know, a, a way to gain efficiency and do more with less resources. Definitely. Um, next topic that we've got here um, is case management systems. Um, and as with most of these areas, um, or as with everything in the baselines, they're really written to be um, general and to give you some things to uh, consider. Um, there isn't a particular case management system that we recommend, but there are several different basic feature sets that are part of this baseline. Um, and one of the things that I would really recommend in starting to look at a case management system or uh, change case management systems um, is not only looking at what you currently do, um, but going out there and talking to several different um, both vendors and actual organizations that have 
uh, implemented these case management systems, about their workflow, about what they use the case management system for. Um, the features between them tend to be uh, very different. The types of things that you can do in person or remotely or cloud hosted versus on site can be very different. And one of the best things to do is ask the email list who is using a particular case management system and connect directly with organizations that are using them when you're evaluating um, a new case management system. If you need any help in finding individuals, about two years ago, we asked the community generally uh, if there were people that were would be willing to mentor or share from different organizations, and we still have that list available. Or if you have trouble finding someone who's using an organization, and TAP's definitely here to help that. Um, the baseline itself goes far beyond the flexible, responsive, and portable that are just on this slides. It's one of the larger sections. Um, it has different things that are even more down there to the tactical side, including conflicts checks, entering and editing, um, CMS data in real time, that type of stuff. Um, Jane, have you got any recommendations for people that are either looking at changing to a new case management sim system or implementing one and how to deal with this rather long baseline that could be an entire webinar in and of itself. That's true. Um, well, one thing I want to point out too that's that people have found helpful is we've started, LSC has started um, extracting the data we collect. Uh, we've done this for the, I think about the last three, three years or so um, from we we it's called our K form. Uh, so we we ask for uh, what technology systems programs are using, uh, and that is available on our website. Uh, and there's sort of some good graphics um, that that are associated with it. it it's under the, the data portion. I will text in the link to it uh, in the chat box. Um, but that also that has actually a list of everybody who's currently using different case management systems so um you know it, it it's it's usually it might be a few months behind because we collect the data like every spring so you know by the fall if somebody's changed over that might not be um completely up to date but it's pretty accurate in terms of trying to you know if you're thinking about switching and you want to find somebody similar size program that's using something you're looking at um, then you can you can uh, use that as a resource as well. Um, I guess the 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 other thing is just um, do your research. Uh, you know, make sure you you get good demos from uh, from all of the providers. Uh, they are all willing to come in, show you some good demos. Uh, you know, have again have staff at different levels. There are some systems that may be better at doing intake and other systems that are better at doing uh, management of cases and supervision. Um, some have some more innovative features. Uh, so you kind of have to think about um, what's going to best meet the overall needs and goals of, of your organization. Uh, and make sure you plan enough time for it. You know, these this is a this is a major change um, in, in that type of system. It's not something that you can expect to do in six months. Um, so the link is in the uh, chat there. Um, and on the email list serve um, on March 2nd, David Bonebreak um, also uh, sent out that information and has uh, several different breakdowns for software usage, uh, connectivity and networks, um, LSC data, tech technology generally, and then specific um, legal aid stuff. I'm going to put all of those links in. Um, I'd like to take a second and welcome uh, William Guyton here um, as part of this discussion. And uh, if, uh, if your audio is working, I would like to kick it over to you for a second and ask for your thoughts on um, implementing case management systems or some of the best practices or things that organizations should really uh, give a try to or consider while going through that process. And those additional links are now in the chat. Um, thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Good. Sorry. Apologize for, for being late. Um, I've gone through two conversions, uh, both in Alabama and now in Oklahoma. Uh, converting from different, uh, converting from legal files to legal server in Alabama and converting from Prime 
to legal file uh, a legal server in Oklahoma and uh, as many times as I do it it's always uh, there's always a couple of little things that that, that basically make your life uh, difficult and it, it's it usually uh, revolves around understanding the workflow of the firm and uh, what piece of the case management system is more important rather than the others. Because um, we have a tendency to, to focus on migrating everything and in reality, a good 50 to 60 to 70 percent of the data that, that's in your old case management system is, is probably not relevant anymore. You probably should have been gotten rid of at the seven year uh, data deletion point uh, in terms of data data you want to retain and not retain from an e-discovery perspective, but the the you know the thing that I've learned just the hard way is really fundamentally talking to to staff and understanding how their case management system works fundamentally works for them and their workflow and the and how that how that impacts the way the office works. Um, you may go into a situation assuming you understand the way that that case goes from intake to to representation and come to find out that it really doesn't work the way in reality it doesn't work the way you think it does uh, until you've actually interviewed staff and, and actually walked through the process um, so that that's just my big takeaway in terms of things that uh, those kind of those software skills uh, soft skills that you need to have when you're when you're migrating from an old case management system to anything. Mm. Um, Jeff, have you got any uh, suggestions of the type of questions that people should be asking when they're looking at case management systems? What what helps a transition go well for them? Well, having done this, and in case anybody's not aware, I, I'm on the legal server team, so I didn't participate in the, the baseline list here, Alice and Paul, the, my co-chair at the NLADA tech section did that part. Um, the biggest, tr you know, issues I see are um, data quality and not having uh, clean data. <laughs> so um, right now, you know, and there's still some folks who are keeping things on spreadsheets and that sort of thing. So, um, but even in even in case management systems or other kinds of databases, it turns out over the years people fiddle with them, um, or there's just a bad data and that that can make transition difficult but it's interesting to me this conversation is about you know picking and choosing and that sort of thing where i think when the baselines were originally drafted you know the i think i think the main gist was let's get to systems you know and right. and not uh and and use the technology that's out there and i i just don't think that's even controversial anymore the the the, the funders needing reports and that sort of thing just necessitated a, a, a pretty serious uh, purpose-built tool. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and one of the things that um, I definitely recommend is in this process, try to create a few, uh, what I would call personas, uh, individual user types from your organization, figure out what the workflow for them is gonna be, what their most common uh, features are, and how those can uh, be represented easily for an individual um, so they don't have to bounce around to a bunch of different screens so that it is um, efficient in how they use it um, and then uh, test it with them as you're putting that forward so that you make the, tra the transition or the upgrade those types of things as easy as possible for staff whenever you do something like this uh, training is a big part of the transition also uh, any final words or before we move on to supervision? I think we've covered this. Um, on supervision, um, we've got several different things that are um, kind of covered in the in this, um, but there's a lot of areas where technology can really help uh, calendaring, document production, timekeeping, um, supervision data, um, online research. These are, this is a very broad topic. This is another one that could easily be a webinar in and of itself. Um, but you know, finding ways that individuals can collaborate on documents that they may be able to check them out or um, work off of uh, best practices that other people have already put forward, um, use a pleading that somebody else has and improve that as part of whatever you're doing there. Um, 
are there some suggestions of um, software or tools that people should look at um, that are relevant to kind of your senior attorney or um, admin staff in this supervision area that people would really recommend? Now uh, let's uh, over to Jane first. Um, well, first is is this is really kind of underneath and part of um, the importance of it, the making full use of your case management system. Um, you know, do managers have the ability to uh, see case lists of the people they're supervising, be able to do remote reviews of those cases um, with them, uh, you know, be able to see is, is there something that, that they need to kind of find out what's going on with this or not. Um, you know, that, you know, being able to use, like I said, you, you use what you have to its, to its full extent. That should be something all supervisors have access to and is really easy for them to, to pop up and, and get those types of reminders um, and see. In terms of, of kind of, um, uh, you know, remote supervision, we, we in legal services, you, you often have um, um, uh, teams that are spread, spread across a state or a service area and um, you know we've we've found people use uh, web conferencing tools like the GoToMeeting or JoinMe or WebEx. Um, you know those are all really good good tools. Idealware.org uh, that's a good resource for. Um, they are often uh, doing articles about uh, it, the differences between those different types of remote software tools. Um, you know, Skype now is built into Office 365. It offers, um, you know, the ability to do presence and chat and instant messaging, uh, as well as uh, really quick and easy uh, check-in meetings, things like that. Um, so, you know, it's 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 the the growth of all of those tools uh, make it make it um, uh, much easier to to work remotely and supervise remotely as well. Mm -hmm. Also, definitely, if you're if you're working with a large team, if you've got a, a hotline with several different attorneys, uh, being able to see easily open and close cases to see what they're working on, the, those type of things um, can help you identify areas where individuals uh, need help very quickly, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, William, do you have any recommendations or thoughts here? Um, well, we're we're very much having to relearn the the supervision piece um, in Oklahoma primarily because we we are competing for and and getting grants that that really fund an embedded attorney. Uh, we're seeing more and more of our staff are embedding in 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 third party organizations. They're in legal med legal medical partnerships, they're in they're in clinics, they're in domestic violence shelters. Um, we've seen a, a, a fairly large number of grants that we've received over the last two years that 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 basically fund an embedded position. So we're having to figure out as an organization ex exactly what those remote supervision tools are and what that what the best tool set is. And it's one of the reasons we've spent the last year and a half and we'll spend the next year and a half migrating to all off-premise services. So 365 and Dialpad and AWS and Google and all of those remote tools uh, that help us uh, be effective as an organization where in another year or two, half of our attorneys will not be in a physical law office. Wow, half of your attorneys. that We, we just put in the capability at Northwest Justice Project um, to be able to have individuals on our hotline from anywhere throughout the state or potentially even um, at home. And we just drafted our first kind of uh, um, uh, remote supervision um, telecommuting uh, policy. And we're having individuals uh, apply for that. And um, that is one of those areas where uh, technology and supervision and your case management system all kind of merge together um, and how you deal with that uh, bring your own device policy and other stuff going on also. Um, yeah. any... I mean, everything we're doing is 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 web-based because we don't know where that attorney is going to be, where we're going to be representing clients. Um, we can't be tied to an on-prem type of architecture anymore. And it's really being driven by the, the, the opportunity to compete for 
uh, grants that, that require an embedded presence at some point. Mm -hmm. which, which I think brings back a point um, from very early on here in this discussion of really considering uh, cloud-based options. Um, the economies of scale on them bring down the price and the options uh, continue to increase every year. Uh, for example, we put together a document sharing site on site on SharePoint several years ago as part of a TIG grant. Um, as we've been reevaluating that on a year to year basis, we just moved that into a 365 um, environment and uh, no longer maintain those servers because it was just not cost efficient for us uh, with upgrades and customization and the online version uh, improved so much in just three years that it took over all of the functionality that we had originally custom built into the system. Yep. Um, Jeff, any thoughts on this area? Yeah, I'll just add uh, uniformity is key. So, um, you know, I can tell you right now, if I have it, we are mostly remote. We have very little physical presence. We have a couple of tiny offices and all remote workers. And, and yet, you know, part of the way that supervision works is if I don't see someone in Slack for a couple of hours, you know, I can contact them and say, hey, is everything okay? Are you sick? Are you out today? And the only reason that that works is because everyone uses the same tools and they use them religiously. So calendaring, instant messaging, whatever the tools are, great to have them. I think the real thought behind this baseline was, you know, use technology for it. Don't, don't have a paper calendar out by the receptionist that is the, 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 the key. Um, but if you use the electronic tools, it needs to be really program-wide adoption for it to work for supervision. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a lot of good information here, um, although I'm going to speed things up a little bit. Um, if any of the panelists have um, particular points and I don't call on you for a particular item, please speak up. Uh, but I would like to just get through kind of the overview of everything here. And I want to let people know that uh, myself and others are available to go much more in depth on any of these. And if it's an area that uh, NTAP isn't particularly familiar with, what we'll usually do is find an expert in, in the field, somebody else from the community to kind of act as a mentor when dealing with these things. Um, Jane, would you like to start us off on electronic records, some of the things to really consider about in that area, and what would uh, policies regarding access, what, what does that really mean? Well, you want to, uh, you know, make sure you're, you know, that you have the appropriate security levels uh, for your for your records. More and more security is is uh, such an issue. I think uh, William uh, was going to talk about some things too with the, the, our LSC's um, Office of Inspector General just just released a report um, dealing with with overview of security network systems, but also revolves around electronic records and access to all of the information you're collecting. Um, so you want to, the program, you know, make sure you have the appropriate policies um, that that governs, you know, who gets access to what uh, files, um, who has access to, to move files, rename things, how long, uh, what is your, your retention of electronic records, um, and what's the process for um, you know, removing those records, uh, you know, is is it's easier and easier to just keep things perpetually in storage. But as we're um, seeing for for e-discovery and um, migration, if you are changing case management systems for a lot of different reasons, you know, do you really want to um, and should you be keeping things in perpetuity? Um, you need to kind of think about having a set policy for how long uh, those electronic records are going to um, remain in your systems, uh, just like paper records and paper files. And a, and a quick note on that, and Northwest Justice Project has a part-time uh, law student working on a model draft policy. Um, it should be, the first draft of it should be out with regards to data retention and destruction um, next week for con 
um, comments from the community so that we can try to improve it. Um, but it will be out on the email list and we'll be looking for feedback and people who want to be interested in putting together the final draft of that. That's one of those areas where a lot of organizations, they have a policy for physical paper and they, because the cost of storage is so cheap, they end up just holding on to everything in digital and it creates a huge uh, security and privacy risk for clients. Uh, William, did you have some things that you wanted to cover in this area? Um, the only point I wanted to make, Brian, was that if, you, if you're in 365 and you're monitoring your Office 365 instance, uh, Microsoft recently uh, released the uh, the security score .office .com site. Um, so it's a it's a security focused uh, dashboard that basically gives you uh, best practices to follow in securing your uh, Office 365 tenant. Uh, and of course, it, it dovetails into a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of data retention. Uh, personally identifiable information, you know, how do you deal with social security numbers and, and, and bank records and, and, and PID. Um, you have the tools available uh, to you um, through the uh, security and compliance application within Office 365 that will drive your policies and drive your retention and drive a lot of your data policies already built into 365. So Microsoft has spent a tremendous amount of time in the last 12 months developing the uh, the security score analyzer and it, it has a, a very in fact I'm looking at ours right now it has a very straightforward uh, queue of actions that you can do to your instance to increase to decrease your risk um, so the first one in my list is enable MFA for all global admins that, that's probably a pretty good thing to do. Anyone that has global admin privileges within your 365 instance probably should be using multi-factor authentication. Um, but again, Definitely. very straight, huh? Definitely. Yeah, and it, that's the very first thing that pops up. And, and it says, uh, you know, the the user impact is low, the implementation, the implementation cost is low, the threats of not doing it are account breach and elevation of privilege. So it's it's really well thought out. It's in very plain language. Um, and you can sit there and pick and choose which, which actions you wanna research and actually implement through that security score interface. No, that, that sounds like a great tool. I, I would love to even consider putting together like a short 15 minute demo of it uh, so that people can see how it works, something to that effect at a later point in time. Yeah, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm very impressed. Excellent. Um, moving on next to uh, knowledge management systems, is there somebody, I've talked about this a little bit with SharePoint, um, uh, does anybody on the panel have any specific experience with knowledge management systems and some of the uh, best practices in putting these together and making sure that they actually work for the community? or for your organization? Well, I, it, this is Jane. I mean, we've, we've had a few, a few different projects um, to move to implementing SharePoint um, with kind of mixed success levels. And I think sometimes um, that involves, you know, th there, there's a lot of pre-planning and thought that needs to go into how you're going to implement any document management system um, I need to make sure you have buy-in from from management and staff ac across all levels to say, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to that archiving and how long do you keep everything for? Because if you're, you know, if you don't have a good document structure in your whatever you're currently using, and you want to move to a more structured, uh, you know, or, or tagged environment, whatever, however you want to do it in in a document management system. Um, you know, that's, that's, you have to kind of say, we've seen some programs where they've just said, okay, we're going to archive everything, have it accessible, but it's, it, we're not going to move it over because if it's never looked at, it's just stored somewhere, we're leaving it there. And then we start and move over what you need to, uh, and go from, go from there with, with, uh, with a new document system. Um, you need to kind of plan out you know, is it going to be, is, is there going to be tagging? Is there automatic tagging? Is it more search based? 
Um, you know, what are the kind of the tools that that people will actually use? Because if you expect people to add on and and do more tagging as they're filing documents, that may or may not be successful in practice. Um, Brian, I know. I mean, you've you've you know what what your uh, Northwest Justice Project did was one of the more successful uh, moves to uh, a document management systems. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in hearing your tips. Yeah, we we definitely looked at both the um, kind of search appliance option and having a dedicated system like SharePoint. Um, SharePoint has a very strong search though built in with it. And we found from user data that people definitely search, although they also use a feature which uh, we kind of call dashboards. They're kind of like wikis where you have very easily editable pages that individuals can put together and put some commonly used resources. So for example, our hotline area created some pages for the most common like housing resources that are used for the entire group. Um, they assigned an it, someone who just updates and checks on those every month or so and those kind of pre-vetted resources or place where you can put a tier one resource are definitely used. We've also found that the individual work groups, if you don't have kind of that champion or somebody who is um, helping make sure that new documents move forward, um, the, it can get ignored. So getting that buy-in, training people in how to do it, and then actually finding those champions in the organization who are going to make sure that interesting new cases get posted in the area that they're really interested in or update that page if it ends up being kind of a static resource. Um, and then search is just essential. Whatever system you use, make sure that there is a good search. The tagging of documents on the way up sounds like a great idea, but it's very difficult to get people to um, put the tags in. It ends up being a transactional barrier to adding new items. And in uh, the last thing you wanna do is discourage people from adding stuff. So I would say search is more important at this point than tagging. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on the knowledge management systems? And a quick note, the resource that William had mentioned is in the um, chat as a direct link. Um, it's securescore.office.com uh, dashboard, or I won't read out the whole URL. It's there. Um, check it out in the chat if you want to uh, use that resource. I think given time, we're going to move forward to uh, legal information statewide websites. <coughs> um, this is an area that has a lot of different things on it. Um, two of the really important areas that come out of this um, are uh, statewide collaboration between other partners that are there and figuring out ways uh, to get them to help update or add new information resources. <laughs> including services that are offered. One of the things that we're working on currently for Washington Law Help is the ability for the volunteer lawyer programs um, to add, update, or change their own clinic schedules, their own uh, resources that are available through our site, so that if somebody's asking for help in a particular area, uh, they may get direct referrals from that information, and that information is updated uh, more often. There are several different platforms that you can use for creating a statewide uh, website. The two most popular ones at this point are uh, Drupal using the DLaw template, um, which is freely available, open source, although you can also get vendors to host, manage, do um, service on that also. Um, and then the Law Help uh, platform through Pro Bono Net. Um, there are some great examples out there of websites that are done on both, and there was a major audit of those websites that was done, um, and the information released about that at the last uh, TIG conference. Um, those sessions were recorded, and they're uh, well worth looking at as they talk about uh, different things to look at in uh, legal websites. Um, Jane, can you give us a little bit more information on this area? and? Uh, some of the things that you think really help a successful statewide website. Sure, um, and as you said, there's there's actually going to be another session at the Equal Justice Conference, and we're finalizing kind of the external 
uh, report and, and toolkit that was developed out of the statewide website evaluation project, which was funded through um, a generous grant from the Ford Foundation that uh, LSC uh, received. Um, some of the some of the, the the most important takeaways from that were things like the importance of developing a mobile first approach to uh, website design, um, to use uh, you know uh, very um, uh, to kind of modernize the, the visual graphics uh, and, and overall usability of the sites. There was a lot of focus on actual user testing, um, you know, and, and accessibility that, that I think it's, it's up to uh, 20 to 25 percent of the population has some kind of accessibility um, issue so that if you design for for good uh, website accessibility, then uh, that site improves the usability for for everyone. Um, so, and there's some there's some good tools and resources that that uh, they'll be providing about how to uh, to assess your site. Um, one of the things I think we found too with with some of the sites is just uh, the, there's. Um, there's sometimes there can actually be too much content or not enough kind of prioritization of the, the content. So if somebody searches for something or goes to an area, you get a really long list of resources, but you know, they're not really sure, well, what's the most important thing for them to look at? Uh, so sort of thinking about, um, you know, how do you break that content down into uh, sort of a more step-by-step -step approach for an end user. So here's some some basic information. If you need more information, go to this next step. Here's sort of the next steps you can take. Um, you know, those those kinds of uh, uh, dynamic help and guidance uh, are just really important. Um, but that you know that could again this could this will and can be a whole nother session. So mm -hmm. um, there'll be additional resources uh, coming out in uh, the next uh, month or so uh, with the with the toolkit and the the final external report on on uh, that assessment project. Excellent. I really look forward to seeing that toolkit. I mean, one thing that has really jumped out at me is the the number of different resources that are available. Um, I, I would love to maybe late in this year or early uh, next year do an equivalent of 50 tech tips type webinar where we just do uh, 50 resources for um, individuals implementing uh, baselines because there's just so much good stuff out there and we've got a whole slide full of um, links, but I'm sure there's a lot more if we kind of crowdsource that with the community. Um, moving on to uh, social media here and what really the um, kind of focus for social media um, should be. This is definitely a newer area on the baselines and it's one of those things that I think um, will at next time that we see an update or in the future, will this is something that will even be uh, covered more. Uh, but one of the things that is most important to me really links in with a comment that Jane just made over mobile technology for clients. Um, one of the things that we see at our statewide websites is more and more people coming using mobile devices and we need to design for mobile first. Um, social media is designed for mobile first. We took all of our videos from both LSNTAP and Northwest Justice Project, put together a pair of YouTube channels to distribute those. The number of people that view those videos went through the roof. We're getting more mobile device use. It just makes it so much easier to distribute that information to the community. With regards to Facebook, um, we're in the middle of a project put together by a three third year law student from Seattle University Law, which I highly recommend working with uh, law students if you get an opportunity, um, who also works at Microsoft in their artificial intelligence area and is um, working on a chat bot with us that will let somebody come to our Facebook page ask a few questions and then get referred to or their question answered or referred to a portion of our statewide legal website. 
Um, most of the referrals that I personally give out on legal issues are people asking me stuff on Facebook, going to where your clients are and making it easy to find you and your legal resources help significantly. And I know this is an area where there's a lot of fear in the community, um, but it is definitely worth looking at because that's where your clients live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, does anybody else have any comments on social media that they would like to add or uh, interesting ways that it really interacts with the baselines? Hey Brian, this is Jeff. I just want to say the baseline itself is really general. Uh, it just says that each organization should have a strategy as to whether and how they use social media. And um, if you do use social media, um, you should have a policy to govern its proper use. So that, that should um, include the agency owning the account. You know, that sounds small, <laughs> but in, in some places this has happened, right? Somebody's like, oh, I know Facebook. Like, I'll become me myself as a, uh, my, my personal account. I'll, monitor, I'll um, spin up that org site. Um, that's something to look out for. But the baseline itself, like you need it if you have a plan and if you actually implement um, some social media efforts, if you have a policy to govern that. And this was, I think, the team that met was um, LSC, you know, Jane was there, Glenn, David Bonebreak, and then NLADA. And so we didn't really address this, but the baselines are designed to be just that. They're, um, they're suggestions and uh, a self-auditing tool. So this baseline is very simple and um, implementing social media is, is, a, is a, well as a big topic. You know, more and more, you're trying to see how do you uh, create resources to help encourage pro bono attorneys to take cases. Um, some of it can be training for the pro bono attorneys. There's a really uh, good project going on in California with um, Los Angeles and the, and the statewide um, uh, uh, California Support Center on uh, uh, creating online trainings because often that's an uh, impediment to, to getting pro bono attorneys to take those on. Um, you know, the, the one caveat I think I would just say in terms of, of it's still a limitation with, with technology is, is a tool. It's not necessarily always uh, a standalone answer. They're, they're, um, you know, we found that you know, as much as you can automate the process of kind of putting cases out there and asking pro bono attorneys to come uh, take a case, they're interested, get an assignment, they can get the information and do all of that automatically. Um, you know, if you if you build it, they may not come. Uh, you know, you still need to plan for uh, having enough um, uh, kind of in-person and interpersonal relationships uh, to get people to come onto the site and to use the tools. Um, so it's 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 always kind of a balancing act of of having the tools available, make it as easy as possible, you know. But don't forget about still needing to build those interpersonal relationships as well. I guess two quick points on this particular area. Um, when we looked at upgrading our phone system at NJP, we looked at how could we possibly integrate pro bono attorneys, and we now have a uh, technology support structure that would allow them to participate or uh, enable them to participate externally as part of that planning. So it, it really needs to be something that you look at when you upgrade or look at new technology. I've also been involved um, with the Washington Web Lawyer Project, which is similar to the ABA's um, Online Legal Answers Project. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity to do online uh, clinics to provide information back and forth. Um, we've seen some very good examples of being able to do very limited scope, uh, answering one or two questions for someone and being able to help them out. We are just in the process of evaluating um, how useful uh, that is, if it's helping people with their day in court, that type of thing. Um, I hope to have some more information coming out in a report within the next year um, on that. And I'll be uh, putting some pressure on ABA to share the outcomes type side of that type of stuff. But I think there's a lot of technology that could be used. But Jane hit on one of the most important points. You need a community manager, a uh, legal supervisor, somebody who is going to um, 
oversee that and help make those partnerships with uh, private firm attorneys, other people, so that they are participating in it. Um, it's not a matter of just standing up the technology. It is really a community-based effort that someone needs to shepherd. Moving on next to training. Uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier, um, but there should be some effective continual training that is put in place for your staff. The way that I like to think of this is the equivalent of the CLE type credits is a technology continuing education for your staff. Um, sit them down, do a, a security training, talk to them about your social media policy, and then uh, work with them in crafting those messages if that's part of their job. Uh, make it interactive. Um, we have larger lectures here, but the advantage that you have working with your staff is the ability to do smaller group and interactive trainings around that. Um, we also try to share a lot of the free trainings that are available throughout the community. Uh, Joshua Pesky, who does security trainings, has kind of a, a security ninja series that he is uh, putting online available for free. We will be sharing those um, as they come up with the community on the email list. But there's a lot of resources out there and finding the ones that are relevant to your staff and integrating them into your training is definitely uh, well worth it and part of what you should be uh, planning forward. Um, I'd like to turn it over to another panelist at this point um, to cover some of the broad stroke areas around security. Um, what types of things should we really be looking at in security? We've touched on it a little bit uh, with that security audit, um, but what other are the really important baseline security things here? Jeff, are you willing to take a first run at this? Uh, sure, no problem. So, you know, again, we're just going over what the baselines are. Uh, it, it is its own topic, but we, some of the things that are listed are keeping operating systems and antivirus and other software up to date in the link that I think William has shared from the OIG's uh, <clears throat> visit of a few programs. Uh, that was one of their top recommendations was keeping things up to date. And our most... <laughs> The, the guy who I'm pretty sure could read everything about my life in five minutes if he wanted to, who works for us, the very first thing he told me is, it sounded so simple, keep your, <laughs> keep your, uh, keep your uh, operating system up to date because when um, security holes are identified, the good software vendors get a patch out really fast. Um, we also have in here in the baselines to maintain backup and recovery systems, the uh, we, we need to have security policies and procedures for protecting client and case data. And then it talks, we talked a little bit in the baselines about sensitive and personnel data. So probably everyone on the call, I recommend we all make sure we know about especially sensitive data. It's more than just social security number or date of birth. Um, and the server and equipment should be kept in a secure and environment uh, i mean at least at least put it in a in a room with a with a lock um pretty sure most programs across the country i could put on a put on a polyester shirt and put my name on a patch and walk right in um and and touch some data that i shouldn't shouldn't get get to the uh, disaster having a disaster recovery plan is in there policies on the use of the internet and social media so you know every use case is different uh, I think at the end of the day, most of this is, is resolved if you do good user training about how to recognize malware and phishing. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you guys, I'm constantly doing it with my family. <laughs> so like, no, no, just because it says your browser's slow, don't click on the wiggling little box with the OK on it. And, you know, some of the organizations on this call are pretty big, so um, that information needs to get passed down. And there was a there was a discussion on LSN tap about instant messaging and encryption. And like a lot of these, it, it kind of, in my opinion, gets sidetracked on questions of privilege and confidentiality um, as it relates to lawyers. I think these security uh, baselines are really focused at um, what is the baseline you have to do to keep information safe from accidental loss or from a bad actor trying to grab it. So um, we had a long discussion on the, the very important LSN tab email list. And you know, the conclusion was 
encryption in transit, which is the current pretty much state of the art, unless you use a, um, a, a specific set of tools, is, is probably fine. And uh, <laughs> security for tablets and mobile devices, flash drives, USB sticks, Personally, I would encourage everybody to think about just not allowing them their use, as painful as that might be. And then when people are working remotely, the baseline is that you should have policies uh, in place for security, security, data integrity, and data storage. Um, where I work now, I also give them permission to scan me and try to hack my home network because I do work from home. So periodically, I can get um, basically audited <laughs> to see if what I'm doing here is secure. Legal aid program, that's not a baseline. That's probably, probably maybe over the top. But um, uh, it, the baseline says there needs to be a policy, and hopefully that by having one, you transmit to workers that, um, you know, great, you get to work remotely or you get to work out of a hospital. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, but you're, you're touching and viewing very sensitive information about our clients and uh and so we need to think about security in relation to those mm -hmm. now there's just so much stuff in this area i strongly agree especially on uh once we get into bring your own device policies that type of stuff we've covered the data destruction uh, a little bit but having ways to clear that data to wipe remotely to make sure that individuals have uh, up-to-date virus scans. I, I strongly recommend even uh, providing that in the remote um, work environment because it's it's so essential that it must be kept up to date. Um, additionally, the comments on the uh, thumb drive that is it's a really challenging one. What you have to do is make sure that you enable ways that individuals can securely take that data and use it in court or use it at home. Um, if you're going to ban that, if you just ban it outright, you create this kind of shadow IT network where people are just going to do it anyways. So you have to give them easy alternatives that are safe and secure um, because the last thing you want is them using their own tech and not telling you about it. Uh, so having a great bring your own device policy, having a, a good remote working policy, a look at anonymizing the one that uh, NJP did and trying to use that as an example that we can post on the LSNTAP website. But uh, these are just so important for security. Uh, we've talked some about uh, maintaining backups, having um, multiple systems that are in multiple locations. The ability to do this with cloud-based technology is very, very easy, even if you're using on-site. Um, at NJP, um, we are looked at and did implement for our email and for our phone system um, backups that are one's hosted here on the west side of the state and the other one's hosted on the east side. We're really trying to think about disaster planning. If there's an earthquake or something that goes on, we don't want the whole organization going down and we want the ability for people to be able to reroute calls, uh, use Skype uh, on their phone in order to access their voicemail from clients, that type of stuff, even though our main server may be down in a particular area. Um, I've mentioned the trainings here, and as we're getting at the very, very end, um, I would like to move forward to um, a list of resources that's here and open it up entirely for uh, questions. I am going to paste this entire list of resources into the chat, um, and I'm going to give each panelist, as we've got about uh, 10 minutes here, uh, two to three minutes apiece to cover any particular topic uh, that we weren't able to get to or that they think um, is very important for people to look at in these uh, last few minutes while I cut and paste these resources into our chat. Um, William, would you like to go first on just covering another topic while we're available for questions here? Sure. Um, I wanted to just, just mention to the, to the group that um, the OIG sent out a memorandum uh, probably last week, I think it was on the 28th, to your uh, executive directors. And, and mine turned around on a, on a Sunday morning and emailed me and said, you know, what is this? So be prepared to, to potentially answer some questions uh, from your executive director if you're in the 
in if you're uh, part of or in charge of information technology in your organization. But basically, it, it's it's the subject as results of information technology vulnerability assessments. The way it's written, it, it kind of intimates that that we were somehow audited from an IT perspective, um, which is not the case. It, it it clearly states it's not an audit, but it's it's really a non-audit service, non-audit service that LSC contracted with a third party to perform, and it and it really revolves around. If you read the entire document, it it really revolves around risk assessment and best practices. So when you see it or if you get asked about it, um, you know, read the whole thing. But most of us on the call that have done enough risk assessments can look at it and say, oh, yeah, you know, these things obviously make sense. Uh, one of the one of the findings uh, in the common security vulnerability section of the of the memorandum is is ri the risk rating is critical and the finding is unsupported operating systems. So, you know, chances are if you have Windows XP running in your organizations that you can should consider that a, a critical risk rating and you may want to upgrade to, to a supported OS. But I just wanted to, to mention it to the group because it kind of caught me by surprise. But once you read it, you'll you'll understand what it is. That is great. I've, we've definitely run into some questions about that. Um, and any of the things that are that are mentioned in it, we're happy to help people understand what they're talking about or that type of stuff. Um, Jane, would you like to take a minute and cover another area here or uh, talk about one thing that you think is most important kind of takeaway here at the end? Um, well, the I think building on that, uh, one of the things I think you're starting to see, I was just uh, at a program where as part of their regular annual uh, financial audit, um, that audit company also provides IT audits. And um, you know, so, so part of their annual uh, audit process uh, was they added on, let's do an, an audit of our IT systems. Um, and I think that's something that we're gonna be seeing more and more of. Um, the other thing I, I, I just heard recently that that uh, I think um, Glenn and I heard this and we both kind of said, oh, well, this makes perfect sense, is um, trying to get some outside technology expertise uh, on your, your board of directors. Um, now, I know sometimes with LSE programs, it's, you know, there's a lot of different requirements on, on uh, the structure of your board, but you can also look at having a technology committee uh, as a committee of the board. So you might have a chair of the committee be a board member, but then it's a way to maybe bring on some additional outside expertise um, just in a, an advisory capacity to the to your board um, and and get some um, some additional uh, people to to help you in a in a pro bono effort uh, with some of the the big ideas and and planning and uh, some of the things that that you may not have as much if you if you don't have as much internal expertise on that then um, that's kind of a uh, a tip and tool. Um, the last thing I, I wanted to mention too was uh, LSC is currently um, re redoing our performance criteria, and the the first one we're doing is is performance criteria area four, which includes looking at technology when we go on site and do program visits, um, and that's going to become performance criteria one. Uh, and Jim Sandman just sent out an email. Uh, last Friday uh, to directors, and I'll see if I can get the link to, to post in there, where we're seeking comments on kind of the revised performance criteria, which which includes and covers technology. So I would just kind of point that out to people. Um, you know, if your directors haven't forwarded that to you to, to make sure and kind of take a look at to, to provide any feedback and comments to us on, on, um, on that as well. Excellent. So wonderful points there. Um, <coughs> Jeff, you get to close us out today. Any final uh, remarks or closing things that you think are really important for people to take away? Thank you. And, and thanks for putting this together. I think uh, I hope folks who have attended have found it useful to hear us kind of go through these baselines and talk about um, and extrapolate from them about some best practices. They really were designed and, and the LADA's, you know, input was to not turn it into an onerous checklist, 
uh, that made programs roll their eyes, but really is guidance. So I hope I hope people see it that way. I think it's incredibly exciting, and I guess if we started meeting again to advise LSC on revising these, I, one thing I would change is I would probably pull out of personnel a little tiny bullet point that says maintain basic knowledge of trends in technology, security, purchasing op options, and best practices. And I think I would make that its own big fat bullet point because things are changing so fast now that some of these baselines already seem kind of outdated. And um, more than any one thing in this list, um, my advice is find at least two resources, preferably two that don't always agree with each other, and try to figure out what's coming around the bend because, uh, you know, they're big ships. It can take a while to turn. And it's just uh, I do run into, as I work with lots of different programs, sometimes they're just um, – sometimes the program just would have benefited from more cross-pollination of ideas that are out there, and uh, there's a real broad, enthusiastic community ready to help every program learn about other options, and I encourage everyone to do, to, to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to William Guyton, thank you to Jane Ribadonera, thank you to Jeff Hogue for uh, joining us. Uh, my contact information is up there on the screen, Brian R at northwestjustice.org. Please feel free to contact me with any questions. Also, if there's a particular topic that we covered today that you would like to see turned into a full webinar or us write a guide on, something to that effect, um, we will definitely take that into consideration and do what we can to create more resources around these. Thank you so much for attending, and I strongly encourage you to join the LSN TAP Google group, which is where all of our email discussion is. It's really the heart of this community. Uh, thank you all.